I've um, stated previously many times that um, Christianity is the bedrock of Western culture. And I do believe that although the majority of people in the West now um, couldn't be described as Christians because they no longer um, um, they no longer are mo well most of them nowadays younger people are not baptized and they don't participate in the life of the church they don't consider themselves to be Christians and they don't act like Christians uh, nevertheless I I insist that our cultural sensitivities are essentially Christian and so although the majority are not Christians they are certainly still on the whole in in crucial ways Christian in character and um, <clears throat> that's rather important because it's fairly obvious from what's going on in the present time when to use a, a, a term in a way that um, a philosopher of science called Thomas Kuhn used it. We are now undergoing a popular paradigm shift in terms of the, the world view um, that, that people have. I mean, I would say that that paradigm shift actually began amongst the educated classes uh, at, the, at the time of the Enlightenment. <clears throat> but it always takes many, many years before these things um, percolate down to the popular level in any significant way. And I would say that that's precisely what they have done, um, really beginning in the 1930s when the, 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 the link between... Um, the intellectual classes and the and, and the popular masses, if you want to put it that way, um, began to really be forged in a, in a really significant way, and 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 the intellectuals in academia, um, in particular the the cultural what we call now cultural Marxists, really began their concerted effort to. Um, <clears throat> disseminate their beliefs, first of all throughout academia, but, but, but um, you know, down to the student body and on into all of the professional institutions where um, university educated students eventually come to work. And so by the time, you know, we got to the 1980s, uh, this process was well, well underway, having had the civil rights movement in the United States and, and the anti-Vietnam War movement, you know, throughout the Western world, um, acting as enormous catalysts, um, really because of the moral horror in, in each case, um, alienated the youth. Um, at, at, the, at, at those times and um, made not just the highly educated youth but just the just the generally educated youth throughout the Western world um, really became profoundly alienated from the um, the establishment uh, that, that up until then had been responsible for uh, perpetuating the cultural character and the moral values of of the Western world up until that time, and so you know that's that's basically within my lifetime, and and so within my lifetime I have been able to see the rise of I, I mean I, I myself was caught up in it as a as a fifteen year old sixteen year old boy. And, were, and lived through it and eventually became disillusioned with it. Um, but in that sense, I'm ahead of the curve um, be, because I was so intimately involved in it. And yet at the same time, 
had been baptized and and brought up as a you know a, a standard kind of a christian you know it's not, it not an, an especially pious upbringing it was just normal for the time uh, at the time that i was born 1953 virtually all um english uh people were baptized because that was simply the convention and um yes we, we um Many of us went to church, but even when we didn't go to church, Christianity was taught in the schools, to, uh, school assemblies, religious education uh, classes and so on. And so we basically all grew up with it. And, and then by the time I kind of got to around 15, this, this new paradigm really started to take hold. And for people of my age, it was the moral horror, the moral shame that was the driving factor. You know, we we were watching peasants in in vietnam being you know just just brutal brutally um obliterated but by american forces um and and you know we didn't see the atrocities that the communists carried out and even if we had they wouldn't have been really the ones that we would have been interested in the, one, the only ones that we were interested in, and, and it, it absolutely culminated in, in the My Lai massacre, where peasants were raped, um, mutilated, murdered. When I say peasants, I mean women, children and, and old people uh, by American soldiers, which was something that w was unthinkable to us. We were the good guys. Only the Nazis did that. You know, that's the way we used to think. The Nazis and the Japanese, only they carried out atrocities. Um, to, to suddenly discover that ordinary GIs had done the same in Vietnam. I mean, it's impossible to overstate the absolutely, total, totally traumatic shock, moral shock of those revelations. And to find out that it wasn't just in My Lai, that the, that kind of thing had happened all over the place in, in Vietnam. Um, it, it was just a complete shock. And it did lead to the, uh, an extremely receptive um, or ear to that new cultural Marxist paradigm shift, which really now only needed to point the finger at these you know, the other one being racism uh, against uh, former slaves in, in America. Um, I mean, if you were English for, and you looked at the degree of racism in America, that in itself was in, almost impossible to comprehend. We had nothing like it in the UK, despite what current um, critical race theory people say. There was nothing like that degree of racism in the United Kingdom compared to what there was um, in, in America, just nothing remotely like it. And so that was, and that, and that was immediately obvious to us. Um, you know, not, not one of us felt that kind of racial hatred um, at all. There may have been curiosity and uh, stuff like that, which, which, which maybe may have seemed impolite possibly. And, and, and the kind of um, pot potential for being wary of strangeness, you know, that, that, that typical kind of thing. Uh, but these were nothing compared to the kind of intense, terrible, violent hatred that we began to become aware of in the United States. And so these moral horrors were, were really all that the cultural Marxists had to point to, to be able to echo the words of Christ himself, uh, the, the, the word that he uses so often in the Gospels, namely hypocrite. The cultural Marxists were able to point to Western society, Western society's moral abominations, which were so obvious at that time, and say hypocrite, hypocrite, hypocrites, you know. And so we listened, we listened. Um, first of all, it was all about tolerance, but then gradually as time went by, <clears throat> you know, it, it became more and more not just tolerance, but the establishment of a new intolerance of the, 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 the 
the human, um, the, the, the cultural um, faults that were deemed to have been responsible for giving rise to um, those moral abominations. And so the theory essentially was that capitalism, that capitalism was the, um, the last uh, bastion of um, exploitative, fundamentally antisocial behavior on the part of the people who actually ran society. And so all of the old um, socialist Marxist ideas of the class struggle were enlarged to, to incorporate um, awareness of sexism, racism, colonialism, um, imperialism. And um, in each case, the, the blame was placed squarely at the uh, door of uh, those who defended and you know and, and, and practiced capitalism and so using that kind of moral sledgehammer to 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 really drive a colossal wedge between ordinary people and and the the um, the old establishment um, the, the cultural Marxists did an absolutely fabulous job of taking advantage of, of people's basic sense of decency um, and, and tolerance um, to, to import, to, to, to carry out an actual cultural revolution. It's not that, that's, that's exactly what it was. It was the overthrowing of one cultural paradigm, which was essentially Christian, and they, and, they, and they specifically aimed to destroy, to undermine and undercut the, um, the, the Christian family and, um, and, and Christian individualism, which is not the same as capitalist individualism, by the way. Um, they, they aim to undercut that and replace it essentially with collectivist uh, values where... where the egalitarian, you know, the equal, um, if, if, the, the egalitarian collective became the model of social justice, and the anxiety to to um, preserve the integrity uh, of what you would call Christian individualism which was tempered by respect for nature as it is, um, you know, like set out in, in the biblical uh, book, book of Genesis where God creates each thing according to its kind and, uh, and, and a man essentially um, is, is um, commanded to... Um, Essentially, to well, first of all, he's allowed to name it, which 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 involves acknowledging all of the different kinds of uh, creature, and and recognizing that they are uh, created by God, which which is just another way of saying that they have absolute value. All of the different species, the kinds of species, the kinds of subspecies, gender, for example. Um, these are understood to have absolute value in the biblical view. And the entire thrust of the biblical view is not empowerment, which is a word that you hear all the time in the new, um, you know, psychotherapeutic uh, liberationism that, that, that is on everybody's lips today. No, the, the entire sense of, of what was humane and progressive in, in the Christian worldview 
was actually the restoration of humanity's primordial innocence. And that's what the cultural Marxists played on, but didn't play by the same rules as what uh, Judaism and Christianity did. And um, <clears throat> in the typical psych psychotherapeutic um, approach, the human individual is always regarded as being wounded, as being a, a victim of wounding uh, by their own society, usually through their parents. And so in the psychotherapeutic manner of, of, of approaching liberation, um, the, the, the wounded human individual is almost always seen as being a victim and a disempowered victim. And so the, 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 the characteristic word that, that you hear all the time, whether it's in feminism, homosexualism, transgenderism, whatever, it's always the same word, empowerment, empowerment, empowerment. The individual is empowered to cast off the shackles, the chains, the, the chains of the habit of being a victim. It's always about empowerment. This is just so totally, utterly, utterly different to the Christian and Jewish conceptions of liberation. Because in those conceptions, your, your true primordial nature, what, you know, primordial human nature was something which was God-given. God-given. And... Really, once the human being has turned away from that primordial nature, um, the, the human being can't really... I mean, the way that it's described in the tradition is disgrace. The, 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 the typical human being um, it lives in a state of disgrace, disgrace before... Uh, the creator, which again, to put that in secular terms, means that they've, they've turned their back on the absolute value of primordial human nature. And so th th there's an inner sense of having disgraced the nature of nature. And because of the way that human psychology works... You can't really forgive yourself. You, you can't recapture that primordial sense of innocence. You've blotted your copybook. Your history is corrupted. The history of your individual life activity. You yourself have actually corrupted it and blemished it. And, and you cannot wipe it clean. You do not yourself have the power to wipe it clean. And so the way that that works in the Judeo-Christian tradition, and it's, it's not a unified tradition, there's conflict between Jews and Christians, but, but nevertheless, in this, the general attitude is in common, that the only thing you can do is to, is to repent your self-destructive, self-corrupting behaviour and just simply present yourself back to um, nature, or, or, or as I say, in the Christian, to, to, to the creator of nature, the one who gives nature its nature, the, the creator. I'm trying to say this so that more than just believers can understand what I'm saying, right? If you believe in God, then you believe that there is an absolute creative principle responsible for the nature of nature. If you don't believe in that, then it's, it's still enough to recognise the absolute nature of nature in that case. Um, <clears throat> but you would still have to see it in a way which, which we know now from the way that um, evolutionary theory and um, quantum mechanics and so on, it can be quite difficult to uphold the idea that all of the different species and subspecies and, as I say, gender and so on, it's quite hard if you don't believe in that 
idea of a creator, it's quite difficult to, to justify seeing all of the different species and so on as having absolute value. But if you can do that, that's enough. That's fine. If, if you have a way of upholding the absolute value of the given um, aspects of nature, if you can do that without being undermined by evolutionary theory, quantum theory, so on, if you can, if you can do that, that, that's enough. You don't, you don't necessarily have to believe in God. But I mean, essentially, it's the same. It's the same process. You really have to just, and and this is a bit. It, there's an echo of Islam here, which which means surrender, su submission. Um, that's exactly what the biblical tradition. That is exactly its approach. You simply have to repent the things that you are responsible for. But you do not imagine that that empowers you. You cannot empower yourself in this case because you are the one who's responsible for having corrupted yourself and corrupted the world. You cannot forgive yourself. You can repent it, but at the end of the day, your perfection doesn't actually lie in your hands. Well, it, it sort of does, but only in the form of cooperation. The truth is that you have to recognise that your perfection is, is a given aspect of nature. It's something that's given to you at the very beginning of your life. And, and, and in order, to, the most that you can do is cooperate with that original innocence. You can cooperate with it. And, um, and so... That approach is just totally different to the modern therapeutic idea of empowerment. Um, and, and, and this really is a paradigm shift, as to use Thomas Kuhn's language. It, that shift away from um, merely being responsible for one's own sinfulness. Uh, sin in the biblical tradition just simply means disordered desire. So if you can, if you can detect that your desire and, and, and has, has, be, has been disordered and acknowledge that and repent it to the extent of um, steadfastly trying to um, not repeat the, the, the sins, the, the disorder. To, that, that, doesn't, that in and of itself does not empower you. You cannot empower yourself to be innocent your innocence is, 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 to use religious language, your innocence is God-given. If you're not religious, it's enough to just simply recognise that your, your innocence, your primordial innocence, is just simply a natural gift. And the most that you can do is undo the wrongs, that, the corruptions that you've um, dumped on yourself and corrupted yourself with, is to just undo that, let go of them, and then let nature do its own thing. And, and, and you have to give up all hope. You cannot try to manipulate nature. It has to happen of its own accord. You cannot force the pace. You cannot force it. It cannot come from you. It has to come from nature or the creator of nature. And that is the paradigm shift. You cannot liberate yourself in Christianity. You can only take responsibility for your own corruption, your self-corruption. Um, and that's the only one that really matters. Uh, you know, if other, tr other people treat you badly, that, actually that doesn't corrupt you. Again, this is all part and parcel of the, the Christian teachings, which is, you know, that corruption comes from within, not from outside. Anyway, I'm only saying all of that, really, uh, as, as, as a backdrop to what I really want to say here, which is um, one of the things that tends to put uh, modern people off, um, Catholicism, for example, is um, the, the Roman Catholic Church's uh, position on divorce. 
And um, I wanted to um, simply state, for, first of all, that having thought about it a heck of a lot, um, I find myself not being able to accept the Catholic, uh, the Roman Catholic um, view of uh, divorce, which, which, roughly speaking, is that um, um, marriage is natural, sex, sex, marriage is a natural expression of sexuality, and that um, natural sexuality is meant to be um, fully conjugal and therefore lifelong. Um, but then in the Catholic theology, that sort of translates it. Well, to be precise, for in its ideal state, it's conjugal. It, it, it lasts until death. And for Christians, what that means is that um, marriage really has to be treated as indissoluble. Indissoluble. The argument is that um, Jesus um, commanded his followers to not um, tear apart what God had joined together. Um, marriage was, because marriage was, was understood to be natural, it was basically understood to be God given. And um, and so, uh, f as far as Jesus was concerned, it, it, it meant that certainly meant that Christians, f for Christians, marriage was, to all intents and purposes, indissoluble, and therefore, um, I mean, it does go a bit beyond. It does go a bit beyond that. Uh, I mean, b basically, this is where I want to j just read a couple of things, but. Um, Essentially, um, the Catholic Church takes quotes from the Bible where Jesus says that um, if a man divorces his wife, he commits adultery against her. Or if a wife divorces her husband, she commits adultery against him. And so the Catholic Church uses those, those, those quotes, basically, or ones like it, um, to essentially say that Jesus was was basically saying that for his followers, um, marriage was to be treated as indissoluble, and that therefore for Christians, divorce cannot possibly be um, accepted. Um, I sim I just simply find that to be um, in, in, impossible really to make sense of in the light of the actual scriptures themselves. And, and so this is where I just want to read some bits just to um, try to um, make my argument here we've gone and lost the blooming uh where are we yes oh dear i've lost the blooming i've got it open at there i know i've got it open at the right page and i cannot see it why can't i see it sorry i beg your pardon let me just find this Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. That's the first one that I wanted to read. So that, that's the quote, that's one of the typical quotes that the, <clears throat> that the, the Catholic Church will, will use, uh, which on itself seems, uh, taken at face value, seems to be very straightforward 
Um, but um, here is another one, um, which becomes more important because it, it, it reveals where Jesus is getting his, his, his references from in terms of scripture. Some Pharisees came up to Jesus testing him and began to question him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce a wife. And he answered and said to them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote to you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. That's a quote from Genesis. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. That's all still a quote from Genesis. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Now, that last, uh, that last bit, which has the form of a commandment, that is Jesus speaking from his own authority. And it's important to note there that he's not, he's not referring that to his followers. Let me read it again. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. He's stating that as a universal principle meaning that nobody, whether they are followers of Christ or anything else, nobody should separate what God has joined together, meaning the, the, the couple who were married. So he's taking his references from um, the book of Genesis. Again, that all seems... Um, Pretty straightforward, but I will come back to that. Um, I'm not going to read you that next bit because it's basically exactly the same, except for one thing, the way that it's the same story, it's the same bit as I just read, only in a different gospel. Only this one does begin in a rather different way because the Pharisees this time say to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And so, again... The reason why that's important is because ostensibly there are s certain exceptions. There is, a, there is an exception that Jesus is supposed to have allowed, and I'll come to that now. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. I'll come back to those in a moment because that's really the crucial point of my argument. Um, the first bit just to deal with is this, 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 this exception, except for the reason of unchastity. Um, it, for, for some Christians, that means that divorce is okay where either the man or the woman has, has basically been um, unfaithful and has relations with somebody outside the marriage. Um, but actually the question, as I said in the, in the earlier bit, uh, that the, the Pharisees were actually asking was whether or not it was acceptable to divorce your spouse for any reason at all, just simply because you're not happy with them anymore. Uh, and that's absolutely crucial because um, that was the question that they were asking and that was the question that Jesus answered in that one where he took it back to Genesis um, in order to explain the true, the, the intrinsic nature of marriage, namely that it is, um, that the two become as one flesh which is what the church calls conjugal love. And of course, when, if, if, that's, uh, if that's how intimate it is, that the, true, the two essentially become as one, then clearly the intrinsic nature of marital love 
is therefore um, lifelong. I mean, it's impossible to conceive that it would be anything other than lifelong because that's how long you are attached to your own flesh. Um, so I totally agree with Jesus that the, um, the true nature of marital love is conjugal. It is the two becoming as one flesh and it is its own inner nature is undoubtedly lifelong. But the real que that that that's not the real que that doesn't really answer the question as to what Jesus' actual attitude to divorce is. That only, in my opinion, that only tells you what Jesus understood to be the intrinsic nature of marital love, and he's simply reaffirming the um, the view set out in the Jewish Bible at the very beginning, namely that it is it is conjugal. It is meant to be lifelong. It's meant to be. It should be lifelong. You should treat it as lifelong because it is lifelong in its very nature. In, in other words, what Jesus is saying is that to be true to the nature of marital love, you have to understand that it is lifelong and you have to subordinate yourself to that understanding because having free will we do have the freedom to disregard the true nature of marital love and we may just do that in order to um, follow some wayward desire you know um, and so because we've got free will although the intrinsic nature of marital love is lifelong our will may not necessarily honour that nature. We may actually be carried away by some momentary temptation and basically or just decide that our wife's got too old or our husband, you know, and that we don't like the look of them anymore. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and basically that would be to be trapped in the immediacy of um, immediate desires and, and lusts uh, but that would be ignoring all of the lifetime of commitments um, and, and, and dependencies that had been created through the previous um, love that we had for our spouse. Not only that, but if we were to divorce on, just purely on a whim for no real particular reason, um, because that was the question that the Pharisees asked, it really would be an absolute abomination because it would... It, it, it would it would make a complete mockery of the marriage from the very beginning it would it would lay to waste an entire history of love for your spouse and and to do that to somebody just just out of a um, simply a, a you know a, a spontaneous urge to for a change or whatever you know for a fickle reason really would just be immoral beyond belief um, that's really in my opinion what the christian view of it what christ's view of it really was but now i want to just come back to this bit that makes me think the catholic church's interpretation of this cannot be right when jesus said that Moses allowed a certificate of divorce because of your hardness of heart. In my opinion, <clears throat> well, for a start off, what Jesus is really saying is you shouldn't actually allow yourself to indulge hardness of heart simply to pursue uh, some other desire. Because that's really what he's saying. In order to pursue some other desire, the only way you can accomplish it is to harden your heart to the love that you actually all, you know, feel. The obligation, the duties that you feel towards your spouse. The only way that you can go off and commit adultery is, is if you just simply turn your back. You have to harden your heart. To your spouse in order to do that 
And so really what he's doing, he, he is condemning hardness of heart. But at the same time, he's not condemning Moses. He's not saying that Moses was wrong to give somebody a certificate of divorce because of one or the other of the spouse's hardness of heart. And if we take the, um, if we take the exception which we found in, in the last quote seriously, it's very important. Let me read that again. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for the reason of unchastity makes her commit adultery. <clears throat> the implication there is that Jesus is acknowledging that it takes two. It, it, this has got nothing to do with whether or not you, both of you are happened. The way the, the, way the Catholic Church describes it is that it, 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 if the two are baptised, then the prohibition applies with respect to divorce. But to me, this, this, this is staggeringly hard-hearted because at, for most of my life, uh, my, my, my childhood life, baptism was just simply a convention. Every child was baptised. There were, and there was not necessarily much follow-up in terms of being drawn into the culture of the church. There was very little. It was just a convention. It was a social convention. So really what the Catholic Church is saying is that just because a baby just happens to get baptised by the parents in a purely conventional way, with no real Christian formation afterwards, nevertheless, according to the Catholic Church, both parties in in the marriage where they're both baptized are absolutely bound by this 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 rule that you 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 know that divorce is illegitimate for both parties for even for the innocent party if it if it's a, if the divorce is because of fault of one but here jesus seems to be acknowledging that it takes two to keep the marriage together. It only takes one. Or it only takes one to foul it up. That is the implication of that exception. And that that is is written in a book which is supposed to be, by Protestants and Catholics, the infallible word of God. <laughs> so we have to take that exception seriously. As I say, at the very least, the most important thing for me that it does is that it, it recognises that it only takes one, it takes two to keep the marriage together. It only takes one to mess it up, to destroy it, in fact. And so <clears throat> the fact is, it seems to me, that whether you're baptized or not, because that doesn't that doesn't eliminate free will. If you're baptized, you've still obviously got free will, and if you've got free will, you are capable of being hard-hearted. And and if you if you choose to be hard-hearted, than just my own ordinary experience of life. Where, where I've personally experienced too many disappointments and heartbreaks to, to simply pretend I don't know what I'm talking about. I do know what I know. I know what I know. And what I know is that Falling in love is a magical experience. It's a magical experience. And once that magic has been destroyed, either through brutal hard-heartedness or just simply neglect. Neglect alone can kill the magic of, of being in love. Just, just neglect just just not knowing how to keep how to how to ref, re, refresh it 
to, to rejuvenate it. Just that alone can allow a ma the magic to go. Um, marriages can die just through human fallibility. Humans are fallible. Familiarity breeds contempt. Unless we strive to keep our marriages fresh and interesting and alive, unless we do those things, or even worse, you know, if we just simply can't be bothered anymore and we just go chasing somebody else's tail, um, that's enough to kill the magic. And once the magic's killed, it isn't a marriage anymore. It, it just becomes a burden. It just becomes a ball and chain. And um, every, most people know this nowadays in Western culture. You know, m most people are willing to accept that now, that marriages can qualitatively basically die so that uh, really all you are left with is the duties uh, and, and no, no real sexual love left in it at all. I mean, just, 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 as, just as a humane person, I have to ask myself, you know, would Jesus have actually wanted anybody to um, suffer the burdens of a marriage which was dead? Um, se sex is a very special thing, you know. Um, <clears throat> I do not believe that Christian ethical love is enough to... Um, join the two together. I think the way that the two are joined together, the way that it refers to it in the Bible, is, is that God joins them together. And I think that's a very good way to put it, because it is, it is like, a, you know, if, if you look at the tarot cards where you've got Cupid with his, uh, you know, his, his bow and arrow, and he fires his arrows, and it's quite often he's blindfolded, and you've got no idea where the arrows are going to go, you know. This, you know, supposed to pierce the heart of the lovers, but you never know who the hell the lovers are going to be. You know, you might fall in love with a terrible criminal or whatever, and unfortunately, that really can happen because that's the kind of nature of it. There's, there's a magic. It's almost like a magical spell that, that that is cast upon you, and it's in that sense that God. It's right to think of it as God joining the two together. Um, and once you've broken it, you can't join it together. You can't just as an act of will fall in love with somebody. It doesn't work like that. Um, it either happens naturally or it doesn't happen at all. You cannot force it. And so it, it's very easy to destroy it. It's impossible. It's impossible just on the basis of human volition, including Christian charity. That, on it, that, that alone will not create the bond of marriage. The bond of marriage is a magical thing that God created when he created the very nature of nature itself. And Christian charity cannot substitute for that natural joining together. And so, unfortunately, because we've got free will and either of the spouses is capable of actually dest destroying that magic by dishonoring it and disrespecting it and which which, which is it's more more than enough to break the spell um then the real question is you know well, what moral obligation is there left after that to try to honor something which quite honestly no longer exists because it's been broken um that really is the question. The way I see it is that Christians are enjoined to respect the nature of marriage and to honour it continually from the beginning so that it doesn't get broken. But I think Jesus is acknowledging here that it can be broken. He's not saying that marriage is indissoluble he's saying the exact opposite that it is all too soluble and therefore make damn sure that it doesn't 
get that the magic spell doesn't get broken as a result of your own neglect or or whatever you know hard heartedness but he does admit that the hard the hard heartedness is obviously a possibility because we've all got free will and so when that happens then it seems to me that he's saying that's why Moses gave you a certificate of divorce. He does not condemn. I mean, you can read an absence. You can read the, the absence here as being significant. He does not condemn Moses for having done that. He simply points out that that's, now, that's only a, a contingency um, that is done when this one or both of the spouses have messed the marriage up. He doesn't condemn Moses for doing that. And now I just want to come to this crucial bit because he goes more than just not condemning Moses. And it's just to draw your attention to this bit when he says, Everyone who divorces his wife except for the reason of unchastity makes her commit adultery. To me, that's the bit that has made me believe enduringly that the Catholic Church has got this completely wrong. And in fact, that um, the Anglican Church, the Eastern Orthodox, more importantly, the Eastern Orthodox Church, which, which was the Catholic Church for a thousand years. You know, East and West were together for a thousand years before the Great Schism took place between the East and the West. So the Eastern Church does not have the same um, approach to this question that, that the Western Catholic Church does. Um, my point is that if what Jesus is saying is that when a man divorces his wife, he makes her commit adultery. You, you just cannot underestimate the significance of the wording there because where in the Ten Commandments it says thou shalt not commit adultery, it's understood that if thou does commit adultery, thou art committing a sin, that's because you're responsible for it. But here what Jesus is saying is that it's the one who initiates the divorce who is responsible for the other one, the spouse, who's being divorced. It is the one who's initiating the divorce who is responsible for the adultery of the remaining spouse. Now that means Jesus is not talking about sin when he talks about adultery. He's he, and for that matter, neither the Ten Commandments. When adultery in and of itself just simply means corruption. It means you're corrupting the purity of a thing. We use the term in everyday language in the same way. So he's simply saying that if the man divorces the woman because she still has a sexual nature and also because she there's no social security in that culture you know she's she's obviously what what's going to happen is that the marriage is over she's as like we all do she's going to grieve and mourn and then she's going to get over it and then she's going to be open once again to sexual relations with another person and as I say, because of the lack of social security, there's a material um, need to do that as well so that she can continue to live. So what he's really saying is, is that if the man divorces his wife, he's putting her in a position where she will inevitably um, go on to have sexual relations with someone else. And that, that necessarily, because you cannot undo history, that necessarily will corrupt the first marriage. It can't not do. But he's not holding the woman responsible for that. He's, he's, he's making the man, in this case, who initiates the divorce as being the one who's responsible for that. So he's, he's actually not saying that the woman is sinful by committing adultery. 
Now that, that to me, that's an absolute eye-opener. He's, he's not, he's specifically excusing the woman from being responsible for the corruption. So in other words, for the woman, she has no choice other than to corrupt the first marriage. She just simply has no choice because she's been put in that position by the man who initiated, the husband who initiated the divorce. This is absolutely crucial for me in understanding what these verses really mean. And it also makes sense of the exception. Um, uh, you know, the, the exception is, is perfectly fitting in, 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 in the context of those verses. So, he's not prohibiting remarriage. In fact, he's doing the exact opposite. He's acknowledging there that the remarriage is inevitable and that it is not the woman's fault and therefore it's not sinful and therefore it would be profoundly unjust from a Christian point of view if, if a person who had been forced into that position through no fault of the, their own and no, sin, no sinful, sinful desire, it would be unjust to... To hold them, so to hold them responsible for the adultery, which would then preclude them from fully participating in the life of the church, or in the Catholic case, it would stop them from receiving Holy Communion. That's just not just, and it's not just even in terms of the verses in the Bible that that, that the Catholic Church quotes. Um, no, the Eastern Orthodox Church's position is much, much more pragmatic. It recognises when a de facto divorce has taken place. And it only, uh, just like Moses, I mean, Moses didn't divorce anybody. Moses merely recognised when a divorce had effectively taken place because of the breaking of the vow essentially by one or both of the spouses and then simply issued a certificate of divorce to acknowledge what what was already a, a, a fact a de facto truth um and so they they basically recognize that yeah marriage the the true intrinsic nature of marriage is conjugal it is lifelong but actual dissolution of marriage is unfortunately a very real possibility and that when it has taken place it's only a matter of common justice to free, to legally free even in terms of the church, the church's own r rules to legally free the spouses from the legal bonds that they previously were held by so that they can um, go on to try to um, re-establish their, their lives, their sexual happiness, which of course involves re-examining everything that's happened and <clears throat> you know, repenting wherever repentance is is um, appropriate, and 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 making a fresh start. The, the Catholic Church really seems to completely prevent any possibility of a fresh start, um, and 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 this is just such a fundamental this uh, difference between. Um, as I say, the, the Eastern Church and the Western Church, but also uh, the, the Reform Churches, you know, the Protestant Reform Churches, uh, which, which basically do um, recognise that marriage is not indissoluble. It's, it's all too soluble 